So welcome everyone. We are starting our next colloquium. Today we have uh, Jan Wodinski from Warsaw University. So uh, he finished his PhD together with uh, uh, Rafał Dymkowicz Dobrzański. It was about uh, quantum information, but focused on the metrology. Then he moved as a postdoc uh, to Barcelona, to ICFO, initially working uh, with uh, Tony Asin, and then he moved to uh, actually experimental group. Well, so still for me. For my addition, but I was helping experiments. So. Okay, and then uh, Jan moved to Warsaw to this international research agenda run by uh, Konrad Banaszek. Uh, he's a PI door, group leader, and today he will tell us about uh, quantum sensors operated in real time. So, Thank you, Jan. Thank, Thank you for inviting me. So it's actually the first time we need the opportunity to talk about mm -hmm. results we, we have got let's say over the last three years since I established the group. And uh, as Krzysztof uh, said, I, I will talk about quantum sensors. And in particular, I, I'll try to convince you hopefully that it's important to think about these, let's say devices in real time. This will be some kind of, uh, so these are the kind of crucial uh, wordings that I hope to explain. So let me start by talking what quantum sensors are, if you're not familiar with the subject, and I will actually focus on the ones we were working on in my group. My group, just to say, it's currently three postdocs, one is already in Singapore and three PhD students. And what, what these sensors are, I think the first type of device will be optomechanical sensors. So I'll be talking here about devices that are or micrometer, the nanometer size. These are devices in which I would like to, one would like to couple light with a, a vibrating mechanical um, structure. So, for example, think of uh, cavities in which you replace one of the mirrors with some kind of, for instance, trampoline resonators or suspended membranes. Another very, I'd say, cool uh, um, platform are the are the so-called micro resonators. And maybe you have heard of. Um, uh, whisper in gallery mode. In this case, the light is actually inside the structure. It circulates. So if you think of a drum, the drum is rather vibrating. It's actually the whole structure is breathing. But what is interesting, or maybe from the point of theoretician, if you obviously put cryogenic temperature to the device, so we talk here about liquid helium, plus we invent many PhDs and let, and yet into designing these membranes, for instance, such that the drum has only one dominant mode. From the theory point of view, we would like to think that it's really a cavity coupled to an oscillator, which I can think of a single mode. And this is sometimes not true, sometimes it is true, but this is the picture I will actually use to hopefully convince you that this is a good sensor. The other type of sensors that uh, I particularly work on because of the collaboration that Krzysztof mentioned in ICFO with Morgan Mitchell's groups are atomic magnetometers. So here we are actually talking of, uh, of atoms of rubidium and cesium in a cell which is microscopic. And importantly, this is run at the room temperature, right? So these are experiments done at, at laboratories, sometimes even heated up to increase coll collisions between atoms. And actually, um, this is, I would say, the long-term goal that we have, I have put within my group. And all these people here are my PhD students. And today I will talk about my PhD student who is hopefully um, defending beginning of next year. And, uh, and, and, and this is what I will talk a lot. However, we've been working actually on two other types of sensors, which I will not mention, but I just want to ring the bell. So this was with my post up This was a project we finished last year. It's already published. So you might have had of NV sensors, which are solid state based sensors. And these are sensors that you have a structure of carbon and one carbon is replaced by nitrogen. So basically, if you haven't seen this kind of structures, remember carbon has four valence electrons, nitrogen has five. So if I replace one carbon by, uh, by nitrogen, suddenly it's lowest energy is preferred without carbon being here, but then you have an extra electron that is flying around. And we would like to think of, okay, it's actually three levels. We'd like to think of it as a qubit, but actually um, there's also more uh, in the structure. However, just to tell you some kind of general message is all these types of sensors have advantages, disadvantages. Here I said cryogenic temperatures. Here I would say actually load of noise because this is a warm system. Okay, so I was saying that they have advantages and disadvantages, just to say that this type of sensors, the disadvantages to get 
the information out. Because actually here it's quite easy to control the system with microwaves, but actually to get the signal, you use optical light and this is an inefficient uh, procedure. So actually this work that we've done was actually to deal with imperfect measurements. And last uh, work that is now recently on the archive, I don't know, maybe some of you working on open quantum systems, I would say there's a bit of passion now about non-hermitian, uh, describing quantum mechanics with non-hermitian formalism. And there have been postulates that, that this will be very good for sensing. The idea is that rather than uh, fighting noise, you will engineer the noise. So for example, here we have three resonators. One is experiencing loss, one is experiencing gain. And by tailoring the noise, you will have some kind of, I would say, critical points or singular points around which you have should have a very good precision. No, I, I, this I will not talk about, but actually it's not true. So if you want take a message, remember, if someone's telling you about sensors, you should always think of signal to noise ratio. So if someone tells you that something provides a very good signals, and this is what these things do, they also are doomed to very high noise. So actually, in the end, our work is a bit of um, uh, disadvantaging. But I will focus on these two, two particular setups because these are uh, really ones that we have explored in real time. So now I will try to convince you what I mean by real time. So I, I get particular feeling and try to argue that you should think of quantum sensor as a transducer. So it's actually a device that is really well, we can now very well isolate it. Some kind of invest, I cool it so that it's isolated from the environment. And now there's this external quantity that is perturbing its dynamics. No, okay. And unless I'm doing quantum gravity, which I need to modify quantum mechanics, this is something that doesn't affect my system. There's some parameter, for example, gravitational field acceleration that affects the dynamics that's happening there. And what I should do, and I should really invest into doing it well, I need to somehow get the information out. And this is done with light in all the sensors that I have shown. So there are two kinds of perspectives to, to, to sensors. And I would think that the mainstream, and this is different from what I would show you, is this, some kind of static perspective. So you kind of ignore, you ignore the fact that it all depends on time. You, and you really say, I can do distractive measurements. And basically I will invest in finding some kind of doing research of how good to engineer the system to get best resolutions. And this I would, if you look up papers on quantum metrology, this is the main drive in quantum information. People like quantities to maximize, and maximize quantum fission information and so on. But this is not what I would try to argue is, is the right way for, for at least for my purpose, because I need something, a dynamical perspective. So I need to a perspective in which I, I account for time. And in particular, because I account for time, the measurement is a part of the sensor. And now I need to actually take into account the fact that the, that the wave function collapse. I need to use the formalism of continuous quantum measurements. That when I measure a quantum system, I, I affect it. No? So this is the kind of change of games rules in the game. And why? Because think of, I don't know, I want to track a brain signal. A brain signal is a, is a magnetic field. Moreover, there are also sources around, for example, if you're putting a coil, there'll be a noise from the main. So actually our, my signals are something that change over time. Sorry for my drawing, but they are also weekly. They are by definition noisy. And then second of all, what I would get is the signal out. It will be a noisy signal again, from which I would like to track this, this parameter theta, but it, there will be also two other contributions. There will be noise of the sensor because my system is noisy. I cannot pull it to zero in Kelvin and so on, but also the measurement process introduces noise. So there are kind of three sources of noise. One is the one that is actually in built. I don't fight, but these two I need to fight. Okay. So I, I put this slide because Krzysztof has asked me to give you some background, but this is more like a technological slide to argue why I actually find atomic magnetometers interesting. So, so I'll, I'll finish that this is not really research, more technology motivated, but I would like to tell you what's the current status of the art. So state of the art is that the best magnetometers that we normally use are the squid magnetometers, which tend to minus 14 Teslas. They look like this. And they sure they, they rely on superconductors, they need to be cryogenically cool. And the main uh, application of this type of devices, which is unique, is the magnetoencephalography. This is a typical uh, picture from a hospital. I think we have a couple in Poland. 
And basically, this is to track the brain uh, activity in real time. So this is not EEG, EEG is electric signal, and EEG is kinetic. And as you can imagine, there are different actually challenges that I will talk about. We want to do quantum. Here, the challenges are you have multiple sensors in parallel. You need to parallelize the, the, the signal processing and so on. But OK, I would say in long term, this is what we should do for quantum ones. But this is now why there's so much work into atomic magnetometers, because I've just told you they operate at room temperatures, right? And they reach um, similar kind of uh, resolutions in terms of magnetic field. So let's say in 2000, this is how the atomic magnetometer looks like. OK, in, in Poland, I would say that the person working on them is Shimon Bustan and Jagiellonian University, who might collaborate. But actually, OK, nowadays, uh, these are pictures from this. These things are already miniaturized to achieve scale. No? So sure, I think quantum startups, also things going on. And in particular, just for you to compare, this is from a paper by Matthew Brooks at Nottingham. Now we are getting there to do these things without cryogenic cooling. And, and this is actually another picture of a commercial device. However, these, you should ask yourself, how quantum are these? So, so from perspective of my research, they are not quantum enough because we would like them to still benefit from things like entanglement from continuous measurement and so on. But Indeed, there is a lot happening in the back. Okay. And now uh, I was both surprised you. So I was told that some of you are working more in cosmology or or, um, uh, or astrophysics even. So I think an extreme example of an optomechanical mechanical sensor, which people think it's actually a quantum sensor, but it is, it's actually a gravitational wave effect. And actually I would like to use it to hopefully convince you that some kind of signal processing is really important if you want to deal with this device. So let me go for it. Because gravitational wave detector is really a device to measure very tiny signals, very peculiar signals in real time. So let me argue why, why it's safe. But okay, a Nobel Prize in 2017. Remember, this is actually a huge device. We have five kilometer arms. This one is the LIGO one. Also remember the, the light bounces many times. So we are actually the effective length of uh, interferometer arms which is 10 or 20 kilometers and now the idea is that we can use squeeze light to actually increase, increase its precision so uh, if you not, have not seen this type of results this is already implemented in advice LIGO so the idea is that remember I told you there are different sources of noise and this is indeed the source of your measurement noise you are using light to measure distance from a mirror your light is a quantum object that has a Poissonian distribution because you cannot really create a fog state of 10 to 16 atoms. So you're always doomed to the fact that when you hit the mirror, there'll be an uncertainty due to the Poissonian distribution, right? So when you think of this, what's being done is we are maybe not squeezing quadratures of light, we are squeezing the photon number distribution. It's maybe more like an er energy time uncertainty, right? So what is plotted here is that once I eject this squeeze light at high frequencies, I increase, okay. Experiment least like to say 3 dB, actually it's part of two for theoretician, but but this is what's done. But okay, but this is not the end of the story. I mean, great, you've increased the factor by two, but gravitational waves, as I said, are very, very peculiar signals in very noisy data, right? How do you know if someone didn't kick or I don't know, stop on your, on your device? And you really need to do lots of post-processing to deal with it. So I want to draw your attention to the fact that um that uh, there have been actually lots of papers behind that maybe we all missed out. And there is actually a huge couple of papers on Bayesian and kind of post-processing uh, methods to interpret data from, from this type of devices. And this is exactly what we've been doing, let's say in my group at very a smaller scale. But let me tell you because I think it's interesting. So this is actually the signal that, this is the signal when they observe the black hole. This is, this is in time, so here's the time in this direction, but what is being done is actually, it's always Fourier transform, something smart is done in the Fourier basis, and then it's transformed back. Actually, everything is happening in Fourier space. So here, the two first two you could ignore, because actually, it's just the fact that you do a discrete Fourier transform, you need to do some factor window. This is unimportant, so let's start from green. I think this is the important step. So basically, if you have any type of sensors, you need to do noise spectroscopy. So first thing, before you start measuring anything, you really need to understand what is the noise in the sensor. 
And basically, there have been 10 years to 20 years of work on how to classify the noise of gravitational wave detector. And if I give you a sensor and it has this particular noise spectrum, then you can, in post processing, try to make it as wide as possible. So basically, what's done here, this is Fourier transform. And then for a particular noise spectrum that, for example, had more amplitudes and higher frequency, it's been flattened. So once you go back in time, you should see pure white noise. Now, now you should use your knowledge of what you are trying to track. So here in particular gravitational wave, you know that it's roughly this kind of frequency range, say between 35 to 350 hertz. And then basically you go back to Fourier and you filter it. And then you go back to time, and this is what's drawn here. And then you see this peak, and this is exactly this chair that everyone been excited that, that this was the black hole metric. But this is not the end of the story, because now, what, how do you know this is not okay? You live in time, so some Russian spy that hacked your system and placed it in there. So you need to do some standard Bayesian analysis, and this is what's been done by these, these groups to kind of um, give some probability that this was actually a gravitational wave. So last thing that I want to say, just to move on my research, is just to bear in mind that even this is just to get the information out, but even to make physical statements, like the physical statement that this was a gravitational wave was based on Bayesian inference. Because if you open up this paper, basically what is being said is, let me assume the model of general relativity. Let me assume that gravitation, the black holes have particular mass. And this is how uh, um, uh, gravitational waves propagate, then according to Bayesian inference from this data, from this chip, I can infer that there have been two masses of this size. Okay? And these are the actual probabilities. So with 90 or 50 percent, they are in this range, and this allows me to extrude that there were not neuron, neutron stars. Right? So this is my point. So the point is that, okay, quantum effects this is clearly a quantum sensor, but the correct way of doing inference is kind of good. Okay, and I would like to move to our results, and in particular, I'll start with optomechanical sensors, which I think it's nice because we can treat it as a toy model. So, okay, so what is an optomechanical sensor? I already talked about this. So I have a cavity, and I have an oscillating uh, device on the side, right? Now, what is what's the physics happening here? I'm driving the cavity, so this is my control. I'm driving it with laser. And now, surely, this oscillator is coupled to thermal bath, so it's decohering all the time. I'm trying to put in cryogenic temperatures. But then I, the, the, there are photons leaking from the cavity, and I measure it. So, in particular, in this work that, that, that has been published, we've been trying to kind of focus on the setup in which the experimentalists are doing photo detection. So, in the real lab, you will get clicks, and you'll get clicks and time one to two, and so on. Okay. And now, Okay, Shushek asked me not to put too many questions, but I somehow need to show you what are the eigen energy of the system. So I'll put some Hamiltonians and a few additions, but just tell you this is not rocket science, quantum mechanics. I have two oscillators and they are coupled. Coupling is really like a beam splitter interaction because I presume that the cavity is moving by very small distances. And this is my driving force. Okay, and these are standard things. If I go to some rotating frames, I will not change the eigenvalues. So I can go to the rotating frame of the driving field, and this is what the experiment is like to work with, is the detuning. So the question is, how far is my laser detuned for the natural frequency of the gravity? And then, okay, there's another thing which is called the polaron transform. Again, it's a unitary transform. These are displacement operators, doesn't, doesn't matter. The point is that from this form, I hope you can see that these are the energies of the Hamilton. So you have, these are oscillators, so they are equally space, simple harmonic oscillators. But you have this quadratic term because you could think that this interaction is like a curve type interaction. No? Okay. So now we want to use this part, right? So, for example, let me set the tuning. This is the thing I control to minus mg squared, uh, okay, to this parameter. I especially put a minus sign here because just to, to make a convention that negative delta means I am detuned, red detuned, so I'm below the curve. So what's happening, the energy is okay. They form, this is a parabola, no? But now I've set this parameter so that the energy level that was zero, 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 here are the number of photons in the cavity. And uh, so the first number is number of photons. The second number is number of excitations of the oscillator, which would be the photons. So if I set it like this, notice that these two levels are on the same level. So now this says that if I'm driving, 
actually this is the transition that this this prefer so basically by doing this i always will get n photons inside the car okay some people look puzzled this is the typical thing in the systems but this is my point and now if they leak i should expect bunching of photons i should expect n photons to be leaking out this is probably Cutting bridge, strong cutting bridge. Exactly. So, yes, mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. So, this is the point I just want to say. So, you might say that, okay, what's new here? So, to, to do this project, we need to be in the strong cutting regime. So, we really have to do numerics brute force a lot. And actually, the two regimes that we I'll show and were known is when n equals one, n equals one, only one photon goes into cavity. So, we expect the photons always come with one, and this is some kind of anti branching. So, it's called photon blockade. Because you can only get one photon, one, one photon is in the cavity, no photon goes out. Or these are called cascade regimes that you expect photons to go in bunches. Okay, so how to simulate that? Maybe the best way, at least for me, as a quantum optician as well, is the G2 function. So it's a G2 function, the function that what is the probability I've seen a photon at T1 that I'll see now the other T2. Okay, and this actually just to show you that this is not calculations, this is simulation. So what I'm trying to plot, what I'm plotting here on the horizontal axis is time one. So when I've seen the first photon, and here is the difference when I've seen the second photon. And we kind of for 10,000 trajectories made a histogram. So what this represents is like in this window, was it more probable to see a photon when I had n was two or n was one? Okay. So okay. So let me let me say once more. So you see there's a red slide stripe at the bottom. So that means that in the two cascade regime, indeed, if I see one photon at T1, there's very high probability I'll see another two, right? On the other hand, if I'm in the blockade regime, there's a blue stripe here. It means that if I've seen one photon, there's no quick photon on site, and only sometime later there's another one, right? So everything is consistent. The only thing I want to maybe also stress is notice that it's not very symmetric in the horizontal direction, and this is what we expect because we are starting. This is really real time, you know. The time goes in this direction now. So here the system is not in a steady state. What's happening here is after a long time, the system will reach some kind of steady state. Whereas here we have effects from uh, from the fact that it hadn't stabilized. Okay. Is it that the steady state is reached after <coughs> time one over kappa? Not very good. Uh, yes. Yes, okay, but I should say what's kappa. I didn't say so. Kappa, it's we also allow for loss. Ah, there are two. There are two. So kappa in this, sorry, is KL plus KB. So for generality, well, we assume that not all the photons will be detected. Yes. Right? We have some process of rising of this cavity. Exactly. And then there's also a leakage from this cavity. Exactly. Yeah. And we are measuring Time the photons. That... One over kappa. So yes. It's expected the steady state is which the one over kappa. Again. I think it's not true. To the, because remember, you also have the oscillator, yeah. which is not very strongly coupled. So it really depends what is the temperature of the thermal bar here as well, right? Because if I this thermal is very high, this will give me excitations. Right? So there are two. So I think it's not just coupled, it's also this kind of play. Yeah, exactly. So this is what we also try to explore. So, okay, the natural question now is can we use this to boost sensitivity of the sensor? We have a quantum device, and indeed, we can use Bayesian interference. So if you don't remember Bayesian inference, I mean, what is the optimal way of getting from a probability distribution some parameter? A bias, or maybe sometime later, tells you that you should always take the mean of the posterior distribution. So what is the posterior distribution? Is the probability that the value of theta is, um, uh, is, is such, given I got the particle of detection, so this photon piece, right? So the, the challenge here is that you uh, you now kind of what experiment is has to do, you need to scan along this barcode, he gets more and more clicks. And based on this click, he, he actually needs to infer what was the true parameter. But what he actually has is the model, and the model gives you the other way around. The model tells you, given the parameter had some value, this is the probability I got such type of clicks. So what I will not tell you about and what's behind all this, now we should use some kind of advanced model of continuous photo detection and these are these continuous uh, measurement stochastic models so okay this is some kind of Lindblad equation that describes dissipation in the system but maybe this is some kind of novel thing to you 
some of you, is this is some kind of uh, uh, Poissonian term, stochastic term, so that in each time step, it either there's one or zero, either I, I, I get a photo click or not. And okay, so this is the formalism that is behind. But let me show you um, what's, what's the outcome. So I get some clicks, I get this is my detection. Now I would like to build. So, okay, for the purpose of this talk, I choose you would like to infer what was the coupling strength. So, so I should construct the posterior and I should get the, its mean. So, this is what I plotted for you. So, let me say I start at the beginning. I say I know that G was between two and 10 in this particular unit. So, at the beginning, you have like a flat distribution. Okay, maybe I draw it sticky. So basically, the idea is like this, right? Then I collect data, so I get TV, and then I would like to compute the posterior. And then you are expecting that it's some kind of peaks with time, and the optimal value, so here is theta, the possibility, right? So at some time, you expect that this will be your estimate. So this is how both and influence work. Okay. So, so this is what I'm plotting here. So you should think that this what they've drawn here, like it's like a slice here, no? So a slice is um, here's flat, and as time goes by, you can see peaks popping out. That after let's say uh, this many clicks, you suddenly reach the true value. The true value was four. And what I'm trying to convince you about is now I run it in this cascade regime. So photons prefer to bunch, or in this blockade regime. And as you can see, once you get enough information, this information, the correlation goes to be down, right? Whereas in the blockade regime, it, it kind of steadily goes down. And this is this is some kind of the conclusion that indeed we are benefiting from quantum correlations between photons. Because once you this is the drop, a sudden drop because of correlated photons. Okay, the other thing is just um, a bit. Sorry, Alec. Hey. Yes. Hey, Michal Ospania is here. Can you hear me? Ah, perfect. Yes, I can. Uh, yes, hey, yes, I, I have a quick question because you have this iterative procedure based on, say, monitoring of this, uh, continuous monitoring of the system, right? Of this trajectory here, yes. Yeah. So along the way, when you do this inference, you have to perform some classical computation uh, like this, yes. using these Bayesian rules, this modeling that you mentioned. So yeah, I wonder, fun. like in actual system, like those things probably will be happening very fast, uh, yes. experimentally. So, and how fast the uh, classical computer has to be to to catch up with that? Like, what is that? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I'll just have it on my next slide. I'll tell you. So just let me finish this, and uh, you'll have exactly the answer. Thanks. So um, well, no problem. So. So I just wanted to finish that if you took static perspective, remember I told you that you didn't do continuous measurement, you measured to a strong measurement. These are these lines here. This is useless because you have a system that goes to a steady state. So after a long time, you will not get information. The whole point of continuous monitoring is that you get all the time spot on out. So the longer you wait, the better. And now let me return to Michal's question. So Michal is really pointing that actually to compute such a Bayesian distribution, so really to do it in real, real time, I need to do it for each value of the parameter. So in this particular uh, project, we're not worried, we just coarse grained it and did it. So you might think you might want something smarter than this. And actually it's not the issue. The problem is computing, given a trajectory, computing the, the kind of standard uh, probability of getting some particular trajectory given some value and, and actually, and this is hard because you need to go through this trajectory and use this, this uh, continuous measurement model that Miho mentioned. So what we discovered, and this is unpublished, this is public, going to publish soon. There is a thing called approximate Bayesian computation. So I'm not sure if you heard about this, Michal. So basically the idea is that in this device, we can really easily sample. It's really hard for me to simulate the operational device, but it's really easy to generate the trajectories. So basically you create a huge library of trajectories and then you do some kind of uh, accept, not accept uh, discrimination tools to construct the posterior. So my answer to you is called approximate Bayesian computation and we'll be actually, I think the first ones to use it in this context. But uh, so this is the buzzword, Michal, if you want to, to, to look. Uh, thanks. Okay. No, thanks, thanks for the good question. 
Um, okay, and now uh, let me go to the more demanding system, which is applied magnetometry. We've been working with Julia, my, my, um, my PhD student. So here, uh, these are, let's switch. So we have atoms, they are in room temperature and actually, okay, give you some details. This was an experiment. I was involved still at ICFO, so I know the, the details of it well. So this was rubidium. We, we normally use the buffer gas to slow them moving too fast, but roughly we're talking here of this density is 10 to 12 per centimeter cubed. Okay, remember that if you do experiments, the atoms that take part are only the ones in, within the laser beam. So actually the actual number optical depth is roughly 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6. So it's it's huge. I mean, let's be real. And then the whole point is that in this experiment, you pump the atoms. So you have one laser that pumps the atoms, and the other you probe. And you pump typically with circularly polarized light. And if you pump with circularly, circularly polarized light, then it's easy to describe because it becomes effective a spin half system. And just to give you a quick reason, it's like you're pumping always in the right direction. So only two levels of the energy structure contribute and actually becomes the half. Okay, we can talk about more, but once you have this, it was very convenient. You can work with angular momentum. And okay, okay, it's formally a Wigner function on a sphere, but actually think of it as a, as a vector. All atoms are pointing in one direction because they've been polarized. And now this is really a distribution where the, the vector points. No? So if I polarize them around Y, they're pointing here. So actually, in this classical description, it's enough. You just care about the direction in which you point. But now we, and in this case, this means that if you probe now with the second laser, so this is what, what it's really Faraday-based uh, rotation measurement. So the other laser is linear polarized. So it propagates through the ensemble. And the rotation of the light, the polarization, is dependent on the angular momentum in the direction. And this is actually a classical model. So for this slide I showed you with the startups and so on, this is for them, it's all happy. It makes them happy. I mean, these are really good devices. But we want more. And how do we do more? The point is that we don't want a far the tune measurement. We actually want measurement that affects the atoms. And this is what people term as spin squeezing. So basically, here I've drawn a measurement in Z. So after I measure in Z and I learn a bit of the value of JZ, angular momentum in direction, is distribution is shrink, no? it's squeezed. So now if I try to rotate, for example, by applying a magnetic field in X, I have a better resolution because this thing is, has better resolution of moving up and down. And this has been the driving force for many years, uh, since 2012, for instance. And the whole point is that uh, this is some kind of a holy trail of quantum metrology is that if I uh, do spin squeezing perfectly, in principle, my error should not scale as one over n, so like independent uh, distributed random variables, but over one over n squared, which is the Heisenberg. So this was the, for example, this, this experiment here, they were showing that indeed you deviate from, from this kind of, this is a log log plot. So this line represents one over n. Okay, but now can we do it in real time? This is all nice, but now we want sensing in real time. And indeed, the answer was no, at short time scale, yes. Indeed, now the problem is that the measurement is some kind of noisy signal. And now in real time, I'm trying to track this JZ component of, of light, and it obviously fluctuates. But now measuring continuously, the point is that it varies on strings. And I need a model that describes it in real time. And this is another kind of framework of homodyne type of continuous measurements. So now, just to show you, you, um, you have again a stochastic quantum model where due to the measurement, this is your measurement dynamics, your measurement JZ, that it induces extra decoherence because you measure in some direction, but there's this, importantly, this nonlinear term, which actually will lead to a, a pure state shredding uh, type of stochastic equation. And this is the one responsible for the variance in space. Okay, so why at short time scales? Uh, if you're familiar, you can always do this what's called holstein primakov approximation, but it's trivial, let's say. I mean, we have a sphere, and now if there's loads of atoms, the radius of the sphere is huge. So if I look at very small times, I can approximate the scale by plane. And then if I approximate by plane, I, I just care about first two moments, right? And then in that, uh, if, if I'm in that regime, Actually, I don't need to compute what I've been drawn here. I don't need to do the posterior and find the mean because there's the prescription. It's called the canon field. 
So come on, filter if you haven't seen it. It's an optimal Bayesian estimator, and I have a linear Gaussian process, which allow people to land on the moon. It's an important say uh, invention. No? But notice there's this one, sorry, there's this one over n squared that I promised. Mm -hmm. yeah. So okay, now I'm coming slowly to the end. Fortunately, there were questions. So what was our contribution to this thing? And let me see how much I can continue. So there was one publication already, now it's just about to come out. So we asked the natural question. Okay, what happens if I add noise to the system? The atoms can have uncorrelated noise and they get correlated noise. Okay, I want to sense magnetic fields. These things fluctuate. So I need to add fluctuations. Okay. Then, okay, I consider particular scheme. I consider this Faraday phase rotation. Maybe there's something more fancy you could do and improve the setup. Maybe preserve this Heisenberg spinning. And then, okay, but this linear Gaussian regime is, I call it a convenient fiction. I mean, if you build a magnetometer, you have a vector that is rotating. So your signal will be a sinusoid. So you better have many revelations no, to actually infer the, the frequency, right? This is what the experiment is to do. You actually want the thing to rotate. No? You, you want this, this, this is not really what people would do. So uh, these are our answers. So first of all, we derive really based on quantum information theory, a bound that tells you that no matter what you do, no matter what state you prepare the system in, the error that you will achieve need to obey such, such an equation. And in particular, here you have the strength of atomic noise, this kappa. And then these are the fluctuations of the field. As I told you, you, don't have, you want to include those. Okay, and I wrote it again when there's no fluctuations because this, this is have a nice form, some kind of noise over time. And if I now say that there are two contributions from the noise, from correlative noise and uncorrelated noise, notice that uh, this one doesn't even scale with n. And this one actually scales me classically with them. So in case, so you forget Heisenberg limit, but at least if you have local noise, you can have kind of linear scaling or inverse linear scaling with them. And again, this is completely general. This derivation, I have some extra slides, but only if you are interested, this will work in particular in particular if you apart from measurement add any feedback type of schemes. You can prove that. So I'll get to that in a second. But in the linear Gaussian regime, we actually saturate this bound. Yes. Well, just a quick question. So, the correlated noise means that it's like it's applied to every atom. So, basically, exactly. So, if I have a Limblad equation, I have a sum over Limblad operators, so I mean, atom is separately, whereas on the first one, you have a big Limblad operator acting on the pool. So, so why the case is like one over n, like this correlated distribution, there's the opposite. No, no, no. So this is known from back my old papers, like with Rafa, when we not fit uh, if I have independent channels. Mm -hmm. This is error. So Fisher scales linearly with n. Mm -hmm. The error scales one over n. Right? Okay. Thank you. So yes. Yeah, so this is some, we, we kind of adjusted this framework to stochastic uh, systems. Okay. And the last point, which I will just briefly show by showing some hopefully cool pictures. Is that now we also have AI able to go beyond this linear Gaussian regime, and then the Kalman filter becomes what's called extended Kalman filter, and then the you need to do measure balance feedback, and the theory is called linear quadratic regulated controller. So okay, I'll be I say the truth for this we had to learn engineering, we had to open engineering type books of how to interpret um, stochastic signals, and so this is really if you do some kind of control theory course. Okay, so so let me just show you some some plots. So the hope the, the game changer was that we can now simulate the system with codes in Julia. It was first developed by Matteo Rossi, and then we have adapted. So here, for instance, I show you this Wigner plot just to save computation, just for n equals n. But you can see like there is no measurement. So basically, at the beginning, atoms are polarized the wrong direction, and they start to precess, and then they decohere. So it, the blob gets more and more dispersed. But now with measurement, you can see that, okay, it goes around, it's in a loop, so it starts with something polarized, and then we get the squeezing, right? But the problem is it starts rotating, so I start squeezing in the wrong direction. So with longer time, I'm actually getting something messy. So how to solve it? First of all, uh, okay, if we have a good approximation of a plane, why don't we let the plane rotate? That's what we do. Second of all, Okay, but we cannot rotate the measurement. 
right? The experiment is fixed in the measurement. You cannot just rotate on the plate at the frequency of your magnetic field the measurement. So we need to do the feedback. We need to apply a magnetic field that counterbalances the original. These are the two quick observations. And uh, okay, and here I, I put some, some maps just for those that are interested. So what does it mean that I want to do a rotating uh, uh, plane? That means I should transfer my model, which includes the full density matrix on the only to first and second moments, right? I should track what the first and second moments are doing. So I formally in this control theory, I would like to form a state vector, which now have first, first and second moment as well as the field, because the field also fluctuates. Okay, and I wrote them for you. And you can solve these equations. And indeed, you have this evolution. For example, here it's Orstein Ullen. So we say that field is following so called Orstein Ullen back process. This is a fluctuating field. And I also included the control because I needed the layer. Okay, and um, and what is this extended common filter? Just really uh, in one slide. It's like these equations, they are super, look super complicated, they are not linear. So what is extended common doing? Extended common filter is really an approach. Let's assume that in small time step, if I get estimates from previous time step, I can linearize the evolution. So what you, what you formally compute is a Jacobian, which is effective evolution. So if this is my true evolution, it's really, think of I'm doing a tighter expansion. And this will be the first derivative. It's a gradient because it's a vector type of function, but this is, and now I can do it symbolically. This is the key. Uh, this is a symbolic thing. I can type in my memory and, and just substitute the right way. And okay, and now the extended common filter is really an estimator that gives you the approximate mean of posterior where this common gain is computed based on this tiger expansion. Okay, so let me finish with some uh, nice plots. So basically, now, okay. Should still remind you that I need still to do the feedback. And feedback, I, I use this linear quadratic regulators. So, what is this? This is the control field. It tells you that you can construct a cost function, which is quadratic. And for example, this cost function should represent something. So, it should represent, for example, we don't want the thing to move. So, we should minimize, for example, the distance in, in one direction. And actually, what it tells you is like it allows you to find the correct field you should put back in. That now depends, notice it depends on your estimate. So, okay, what is the procedure? I'll use the extended column filter to find my estimate. And based on this estimates, I'll feed that in into the system. And the regulator tells me what are these coefficients alpha and beta that I should choose. So, this is like a two step procedure. Right? And, okay, I'm going beyond the linear Gaussian regime, but actually there's this thing called separability, separability postulate in control theory. That if thing was linear Gaussian, I can do these two procedures separately, independent. Okay, so so now I will finalize with some plots that I hope we convince you things work. So when we started the project, we thought that it's enough to compensate for the field. If you ask experimentalists, they will tell you all you need to do is called compensating uh, magnetometer. Basically, if you want to sense a field B, you should counteract with field B. This doesn't work. And actually, this is what this theory tells you. You shouldn't just some kind of subtract uh, what you estimated for the field. You should add the component from what you think is your angular moment. And this is actually, if you don't compensate for the field, you see it, it kind of gets, okay, it's not what you want. Huh? And sure, now if I do it optimally, uh, this is exactly what we want. You get the squeezing in the right direction. I'll have a slight play. Okay, I'll tell you why if you ask. But uh, but let me show you that things work. So for example, this is just uh, data, and notice that n is roughly 200. It really, can go to 10 to 5. This is beyond. We do symmetric permutations of space, but okay, we really up to 500 is max. And basically, what is shown here that if you don't apply the feedback, this line is some kind of this linear Gaussian regime. So beyond here, you this is log scale. So notice that these are really small times; these are huge times. Then here you expect things to touch the, the bound. This is the bound. Indeed, things are optimal. Perfect. And then at long times, you really need to use this feedback that I've just mentioned to maintain some kind of scaling that correctly um, preserves the quantum features. Okay, and you could ask me, okay, by this line does not touch the bound. So how do you know that it's something quantum going on? So I don't have time, but uh, 
natural thing to compute is the squeezing parameter, right? So here for you, I put you actually the inverse of the squeezing parameter. So if it's above one, my system is squeezed. So it means the atoms are entangled. So you can see that one is somewhere here, it's this line, this one. So if I don't do if I don't do feedback at all, sure, things rotate. So I get oscillations that converge to one. At the end, I get equal field state. If I do this naive feedback compensating the field, it even is even worse. Very quickly, I get completely separable state. But now, if I do the control properly, I maintain squeezing above one. So actually, at long times, the, the sorry, the system keeps being squeezed. Okay, and what is interesting in this, and this we were not expecting. So okay, and we, one last thing. I know it's been long, and there's lots of things, but I'm dealing here with sensors that I measure continuously in time. So I'm talking about properties of systems conditioned on my outcomes. So if you think abstractly, I'm trying to describe a system conditioned on my particular trajectory. So this one would say it's a conditional density matrix. But then you can ask the question, okay, but what if I forgot the records? Because this is kind of demanding. This means that the experimentalist might really must really cannot forget this, this measured signal. And actually, what we realize in this type of feedback, he can forget the measurements. So because we are doing feedback, you can think of this like a servo procedure, right? The feedback is some kind of FPGA you implement, it feeds back, but then you don't really care what's in the box, right? So this is really what's known in the field as conditional versus unconditional feeding. So I think conditional feeding, what I was showing on previous plots, is squeezing conditional on the outcomes. And now importantly, it's also uh, unconditional feeding also works. So uh, conditional T, unconditional U. So if you look for the, for the optimal feedback, which is the, um, the dashed lines, you see if I do uh, the bad feedback, it quickly goes to zero. There's no speeding. But now if I do optimal feedback, it, uh, it, this is this weekly line we need to sample a lot, but it's, it still maintains the, the squeeze. Thing. So basically you don't need, even unconditionally, you are preparing a, a very highly entangled state of the system. And this is what I've plotted here for you that this is roughly P2, so we are somewhere here. So this is when you do the optimal feedback, you really get something really nice and squeezed. But if you do this kind of naive feedback, it doesn't work. And actually for those that work on squeezing, we were thinking what is the effective mechanism? And it's called uh, two axis tweeting mechanism. That's some kind of, it's enough, it's effectively a Hamiltonian that has second order moments. This is, this is because we really didn't know what's going on. I mean, Something happening, and so this we then fitted this line shows that actually you can think of it effectively that you implemented by doing control uh, this, this two axis twist. Okay, so let me summarize. So, um, so basically, in my group, we've been primarily working on quantum sensors, and what we've been interested in is really describe them in real time. So, we have this continuous measurement frameworks. And as I hopefully convinced you, to be able to do this, you also need to do the statistical inference, Bayesian inference, or Kalman filters, and so on. I, I focused on, on optomechanical sensor, for we, in which case I, I showed that by tuning this detuning parameter, you can use photocorrelations to increase performance. And here, actually, with this atomic magnetometer, I think we need to be a bit more smart. We need to do some kind of feedback uh, mechanisms in real time. In my group, sure, if you look at my group, we actually work on other things. So because I come from this information theory and quantum metrology background, I still work on fundamental problems in that. And let's say a small gem that I always like is device independent approach to cryptography, which I particularly like. It's some kind of things I developed with a really good master student. And, and this, so let me finish to say that I hope that I have interested you in these topics in which Actually, you need to comply, I'd say, combine control theory, which I'd say it's engineering more. It's what we have to learn with quantum dynamics, which is physics. 